another edition of ICIE Talks. Uh, today's topic is called Using Strength-Based Pedagogy to Engage and Challenge High Ability and Talented Students. And today's talk will be led by uh, two uh, very important people in gifted education. First one is Professor Dr. Joseph Franzuli. He is the director at UConn's National Research Center on the Gifted and Talented and Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor of Education Psychology at the NEAG School of Education. A leader and pioneer in gifted education, Dr. Joseph Franzuli was named among the 25 most influential psychologists in the world by the American Psychological Association. He received the Harold W. McGraw Jr. Award for Innovation in Education and was a consultant to the White House Task Force on Education of the Gifted and Talented. His work on the Enrichment Triad Model and Curriculum Compacting and Differentiation were pioneering efforts in the 1970s, and he has contributed hundreds of books, book chapters, articles, and monographs to the professional literature. Dr. Renzulli established UConn's annual Comfortute program with fellow educational psychology professor Sally Rees. The Summer Institute on Enrichment-Based Differentiated Teaching has served more than 25,000 teachers from around the world since 1978. He also established UConn Mentor Connection, a summer program that enables high potential high school students to work side by side with leading scientists, historians, and artists and is the co-founder of the Joseph Renzulli Gifted and Talented Academy in Hartford, which has become a model for local and national urban school reform. The second presenter today is Dr. Professor Sally Rees. She is a former vice provost of academic affairs and board of trustees, distinguished professor at the University of Connecticut. She is past department head of educational psychology department, where she also serves as a principal investigator for the National Research Center on the Gifted and Talented. She was a teacher for 15 years, 11 of which were spent working with gifted students on the elementary, junior high, and high school levels. She has authored or co-authored over 250 articles, books, book chapters, monographs, and technical reports. Her most recent work is a computer-based assessment of student strengths integrated with an internet-based search engine that matches enrichment activities and resources with individual student profiles. Dr. Rees is the co-director of Confortute, the longest running summer institute in the development of gifts and talents. She is a co-author of the school-wide enrichment model, the secondary triad model, and dilemmas in talent development in the middle years. Dr. Rees serves on several editorial boards, including the Gifted Child Quarterly, and is a past president of the National Association for Gifted Children. She recently was honored with the highest award in her field as the Distinguished Scholar of the National Association for Gifted Children and named a Fellow of the American Psychological Association. In addition to these very important people, with us is Professor Tessir Yamin. He is the General Director of the International Center for Innovation in Education, and he will be introducing today's lecture. Uh, thank you, Nana, for the introduction. Uh, today, the talk will be as follows. Uh, this lecture includes uh, four parts. When it comes to the rationale uh, behind gifted education, as you know, we have a large number of gifted programs. But before we have the, these programs, we have to make into, or we have to take into consideration how could we handle diversity? Because we have di diverse population of gifted people. And that means we have to offer them different types of programs in order to meet their special needs. And when we talk about their special needs, we are talking about pedagogical, cognitive needs, and social emotional uh, needs. So for that reason, we have to do differentiation and offer enrichment activities. And we might introduce uh, teaching for productive thinking or uh, mentorship and leadership programs, entrepreneurship uh, programs, uh, civic education and other types of programming. 
as you know, when we talk about diversity, it means that we have, in fact, uh, to, uh, to deal with the opportunity and the challenge. And we can consider diversity as the source of beautiful richness of a human experience and perspectives on this world. Of course, uh, talking about diversity uh, will offer us uh, uh, many advantages. Uh, we value diversity as a source of mutual learning, creativity, and innovation. Awareness that diversity in groups, organizations, and societies has power implications. Awareness of how I am influenced by different diversity categories. Awareness of own stereotypes and inner pictures about other groups. The ability to change perspectives and step into shoes of others. Sensitivity and the ability to care of equal chances of the diverse groups represented in the system, the ability to bear ambiguity that may arise from differences between different people and different values. Of course, when we talk about the students' profiles, we think about their abilities, interest, learning style, expression style, potential creativity and motivation. That means when we talk about diversity, we can represent diverse population in this way. A, that means we have people who have different abilities, different achievement level, and different uh, potential creativity. Also, they have different interest, learning style, expression style, motivation level, and values matrix. This implies that how could we have the right system that can or that makes a matching between the students' profiles and the available programs and uh, services. And this is the job of any educational system. Of course, this is all the lecture today will be uh, around this uh, slide, but it will be explained by both Joe and Sally, not me. And I will leave it for the rest of the lecture. Also, this is another sub-theory, which is developed by Joe Rinzuri and his team. And also it will be at the core of this topic uh, today. What type of provisions we are thinking about? We are thinking about maybe a school for the gifted, and this is my favorite option, but there are many people who are uh, not in favor of this option, including Joe Rinzuri and salaries. Then we are talking about school-wide enrichment model. And today, the topic will be about uh, SEM and other uh, available resources. And also, we have different provisions which can uh, be introduced within the regular school. And there are other types. There is no time for us to talk about them. But the main engine for you know, uh, developing uh, activities, enrichment activities, and provisions for the gifted students should be what we call differentiation. And we have different types of differentiation. We have what we call content differentiation. We have process differentiation, product differentiation, environment differentiation, and emotional differentiation. And these different types of uh, differentiation can be employed effectively in order to uh, develop and to produce uh, the right instructional materials. Now, why we, uh, when we talk also about innovative differentiation, we are dealing with different uh, ideas. We are thinking about or searching for new ideas, new methods of use, new products, and uh, so on. So this is why we are thinking about different types of differentiation and enrichment. Now, I would like to introduce uh, Joe uh, Renzuri. I'd like to uh, begin by uh, pointing out that um, we've been working on this for 40 plus years, a lot of research and a lot of practical implementation. We've learned more from the teachers that have used our model to enlarge and improve and change the model than actually existed at the very beginning. So we're greatly indebted to them. And also we stand on the shoulders of lots of giants in the field. Uh, many Californians, uh, for example, uh, Sandy Kaplan and uh, people that have contributed in other areas. 
uh, and Jim Gallagher and Paul Torrance and Julian Stanley, the list goes on and on, ask me some time to give my historical lecture because I love those people. Um, however, uh, you see the two quotations on the bottom of the screen there. Ideas and theory without practice are mere intellectual play. We believe that all of the theories aren't worth a dime unless they can be translated into practice that teachers understand. And so we, we pride ourselves on always working toward uh, practicality. And the second quotation there it, uh, says uh, about the same thing. So anyway, there you see a beautiful picture of our campus and we'll move on to uh, the first slide. What I'm gonna try to cover in this set of slides is the basic difference between two types of pedagogy. And one of those is pedagogy for acceleration or enrichment or what we typically use in the regular curriculum. And the second, which you see on the left, and the second is the uh, enrichment learning and teaching pedagogy that's been the focus of our work and ELT we call it for short. And I wanna emphasize at the start <clears throat> that these two things are complementary; they're not competitive. People always say that the gifted, the enrichment people are against the acceleration people and vice versa. We believe that both are important and both have great value. And you see there uh, our area of concentration. Uh, and whereas there's a prescribed or canned curriculum in most cases on the left, our curriculum is one that you'll see in the next slide or two that we try to build around the child. So. That's why I put the word uh, curriculum in quote. And we emphasize that in this kind of a curriculum, only necessary information to address a particular problem that a young person or a group is working on becomes the, the knowledge, the information, the background, the know-how. Uh, and uh, the other things there, you see some differences in time in our work, uh, especially when it comes to our most advanced type of enrichment, type three, is determined by the nature of the problem. I've started on things that I thought I could get done in two weeks and I'm working on them two years later. And by the, I put destination in quotes because uh, that does help set time limits. If you're entering in a state science competition, for example, or you're getting something ready with a publication de deadline, then that also enters into it. So there are more real world endpoints in what we're talking about. I think that the last item is the, almost the way I like to describe our work, work, the student thinking, feeling, and doing like the practicing professional, even if at a more junior level than a person from Caltech or MIT or a filmmaker from Hollywood. They're doing what the big guys and gals do, even at a, at a more junior level. Um, I wanna begin by talking about something that's very important if you're gonna use this kind of work. And that's two different kinds of, of assessment. This is information, let's say underlying ELT pedagogy. And the first type is what most educators are familiar with, assessment of learning. We find out what a kid already knows and that's supposed to help us do something with that information. Uh, the type that, uh, I am focusing on right now, in fact, in a current research project, is what I call assessment for learning. What skills students need to develop to learn to enjoy, be creative and enthusiastic about their learning. And over the years, we've developed a number of instruments uh, 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 to, to gather this information. Instruments, by the way, completed by students. And the three in yellow are the ones that are already built into Renzulli Learning. They were originally paper and pencil instruments. I have interest elizers that are from diapers to doctorate. I give them to incoming doctoral students to find out what they want to learn about when they're here at UConn. And the other ones are instruments that are currently undergoing uh, research and development. Everything we do is research and those will eventually be invented into student profiles. So Sally is going to show you some wonderful examples as we move along. Um, and one of the things, this little slide is to point out that when they were paper and pencil version, 
there were almost endless piles of paperwork for teachers. And so one of the things, the reason we developed Renzulli Learning is all that information, interest, learning styles, et cetera, is now found out by a young person sitting down at their computer. And we built that into the Renzulli Learning System. So go on, this next slide is something that you already know. Oops, I'm sorry, am I going in the wrong direction here? Okay, this is something you already know but haven't thought about lately, all learning. And when I say all learning, I mean from diapers to doctorate exists on a continuum. And that continuum ranges from deductive, didactic, prescriptive on the left-hand side. Remember, I said both sides are important. All to the right-hand side, which is inductive, investigative, and inquiry-oriented. And there you see the outcomes of those things, the major theorists. Um, I always like to point out that the behaviorists, Pavlov, Pavlov, Thorndike, and Skinner work with rice, mat, <laughs> uh, right, mice, rats, chickens, and pigeons to learn to develop a learning theory. Well, the human brain is a little bit more complex than those. Now, the focus of our work is on the right-hand side. And we have a very simple goal for our work, and that's to produce, when people ask me why gifted programs, why talent development programs, it's to increase the world's supply of creative and productive people. The, what I call the gold standard. So there you see uh, the uh, really what is the major goal of what we're trying to do. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that we're not arguing against a regular curriculum, accelerated curriculum, but we do want some balance between just test prep types of education and what we call CP or creative productive giftedness. You'll see many examples of that tonight, today whatever time of day it is in your time zone. Also, I wanna talk briefly about two different types of curriculum. There's a, the curriculum is what we teach. And I divided them into curriculum one, standards, textbook, test-driven, prescribed. And the second curriculum that I've already mentioned earlier that we build the, the curriculum around the students. Pedagogy is how we teach it. And this is a list of major types of different strategies that uh, teachers use uh, in various ways. And I want to also point out that they don't use any single one of them. Oftentimes they're used in combination with one another. So those are the kinds of things that are the focus of the pedagogy in ELT uh, theory. Now, how does this work? Glad you asked that question. We start at the middle, you see a student or a small group of students that share a common interest or problem and, and we'll work on it <clears throat> through some kind of a group project. And the first thing is what we call problem finding and focusing. I'm interested in whales, fine. Now, which aspect of whales, migration, uh, uh, fertilization, whatever uh, kinds of things, uh, food chain, uh, also, you see two other things that we do there. Begin the development of a management plan, which is a, follows a professional approach to investigative skills, and an interview with a fil facilitating teacher, a mentor, a community person that might have special expertise in that area. The next thing is, and I'm gonna have to move this a little closer, human and material resources, and then also a focus on methodological resources. And my next love in the world after my lovely wife and family is what I call how-to books. You'll see some examples of that. We believe that every gifted program should have lots of access to the kinds of books that teach children how to be a filmmaker or how to be a puppeteer or an architect or a designer, a fashion designer. Uh, the third circle is the role of the teacher again feedback, encouragement, a shoulder to cry on, uh, teaching children that they needed to revise and rewrite. Uh, a student brought a paper into me one time and I said, that's very good for a first draft. And they said, first draft, <laughs> you know, because nothing in this world made by human beings ordinarily exists in its best form, first draft. 
And then finally, in some ways, I think what almost unlocks the secret and motivation for young people to work at this level, and that's finding appropriate outlets and students for their work. Uh, audiences are very important. Sally and I wouldn't be here tonight if there was no one on some tele, uh, uh, computer screens around the world. And if young people are getting ready for a football game on Saturday or marching with the band at halftime, they're going to do all those kinds of things that perfect their work so that when they get to the stage, so to speak, it's as an excellent form as possible. Uh, and again, a uh, management plan is something that you can find in our work. If you're interested in anything that we've ever written, it's on our website, www.gifted.ucon, that's U-C-O-N-N, -N, as University of Connecticut, .edu, and there's a folder there on the school-wide enrichment model. Now, the pedagogical core of our work has been something called the enrichment triad model, involves three different types of enrichment and one other process that's not on the screen that Sally will be talking about called curriculum compacting, which is our brand of acceleration on an individual basis. And this work is a little different from a lot of other models in that you we pr try to provide general enrichment for all students, type one and type two. And Sally will be explaining what those things mean as we move along. And then students notice, I don't say gifted for the bottom, but rather candidates for follow-up. I prefer to use the word gifted as an adjective, a gifted program, a gift that is something that's given. So anybody that turns on to one of those things, then in type one or two, or notice the regular curriculum, or the environment in general, watching television with their mother, and one child got inspired to do an award-winning science project. And another component of our model is called enrichment clusters. It's actually become the growth stock of the model for startup programs. And you're going to see an example of how the model works with in the next few slides. So that's basically the way our model differs from it's for gifted or not gifted. We're trying to make school a more enriching and enjoyable place for all kids because that's when lots of hidden talents will emerge. Uh, with type one, we like to refer to as the hook. That might be a visiting speaker, watching a TV show, uh, going on a field trip, and all of a sudden we do a, a follow-up, a debriefing. We then see who wants to do go further into type two or directly into a type three. And notice also the backwards arrows. Some of your best type ones can be type threes done by other children. Yeah, the famous scientists can come and show his or her work, but if another kid about their age shows their work, then that is, is oftentimes inspiring. So type one's the hook, type two's the ladder, and we have a type two taxonomy of basically thinking skills and executive function skills, and learning how to learn skills that are built into uh, our type two training. And type three, again, is the young person thinking, feeling, and doing like the practicing professional. So here we see a little picture of a child doing a project. Um, now, I'm a quotaholic, and the only quote on my door at the University of Connecticut, because the painters made me take all the other quotes down, is this one. Example is the best school of mankind, and they will learn it no other. And so um, I'm going to start with an example. And this is a regular classroom example. And I'm not going to read all of that, but just tell you the story. Kylie Copenhagen was in uh, her, I believe, fifth grade classroom. I'm not sure. And she fell in love with a lesson that the teacher was teaching on insects. And she really became very fond of ladybugs. And so again, with some support from her teacher, she was given an opportunity. So let me bring up one more circle here. She was given an opportunity to start work on this project and also uh, to gain some assistance from the uh, enrichment resource teacher in the school. Now here comes the things that were most useful to Kylie, even things there about starting your own business, but uh, how to design board games, uh, rules of play, and 
table games, how to make and, and, and play them. And so with that information, she developed a, a game. Oh, here's the one, how to start and run your own business that we got her. She developed a game called the Ladybug Game. Here you see the cover of the box. Here you see a picture of the game, but let's hear from Kylie herself. Ladybug Game from Zubmondo, available wherever games are sold. She's almost made enough money to pay for college, graduate school, and medical school. Uh, okay, here's a regular classroom one. And again, I'm not going to read all of that, but I like this story. It's a about a, a little boy named Ethan. And Ethan might be considered a good, solid, average student. Um, and uh, he was enrolled in Enrichment Cluster called, Do You Want to Be an Inventor? And um, before I finish telling the story, let me point out that uh, you're going to see a short video. Uh, and I'm talking now directly to principals. The principal I talked with never thought about some publicity on this. And so she called the Hartford Current, which is the leading newspaper in Connecticut, and they came out and did a story. Well, someone from one of the news channels, TV news channels, read the story and came out to the school and saw, uh, okay. oops, go back one. How do I start this? There you go. Hi, my name is Ethan. I'm in second grade at Southeast Elementary School in Mansfield, Connecticut. And this is an invention that I made. It's called the flashing dog bowl. And the problem my invention solves is we don't always know when my dog needs more water. So this is an easier way to tell. It's by a weight sensor electrically attached to a light bulb. And when water is inside the bowl um, and it's full, the light bulb is off. And when there's no water inside and it's empty, the light bulb is on, so it will tell you. And I think this is a really good um, project, um, invention because people are so busy, they'll get their attention because the light stands out and you can see it from another room. And if your house is dark, it, the light will shine when the bowl's empty, so you're instantly not, your dog needs more water. And the change I made along the way is even though it's called the flashing dog bowl, it, it doesn't flash because I was afraid that if I made it flash, then it would scare your pet and then your pet would want to drink out of it. And, and more than half of the people in the United States are pet owners, so it's so it's a really good invention for pets. And this is my first prototype. We have cardboard and the bowl and the light bulb. And there and over time, um, because of time, I'm going to stop it right soggy. there. And and just um, I want to say a couple of things about Ethan. First of all, again, he was not identified as gifted, and there's a law in our state that, that says you have to be, but he had access to our enrichment specialist who helped him tremendously on that. He won his division of the state Connecticut, remember I said destination? The destination was the Connecticut State Invention Convention, something Sally and I started how many years ago? Long time. Long, long time ago. It's now going national. He then went to the finals at, at the Henry Ford uh, 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 Museum in, in, in Michigan. And um, I just got something in the mail just a week ago uh, about this year's invention that he's working on. So I don't care if he's got a G stamped on his forehead or gifted or not, but we believe in what we call the concept of war, opportunities, resources, and encouragement. 
And that's what makes, he might be a famous engineer someday, and he may not. But the point is that we help them along on that path. A couple of other things that uh, are important ingredients of ELT, what I call just-in-time information. He didn't read poetry books to get ready for this. He read books on engineering, on making things and things like that. So this curriculum, too, is really a JIT, or just-in-time curriculum, information that you only go and get, get when you need it. Uh, important ingredients, again, ELT, and there's a how-to book for absolutely everything. There's even a how-to book for how to write how-to books. And one how-to book, which I don't recommend, uh, it, it, it is for adults. And so therefore, uh, we will skip that one. Um, important roles of teachers in uh, ELT pedagogy. Um, we have two different major roles for teachers. One is the very proverbial sage on the stage, but the other one is what we call the guide on the side. And that's that list of different teaching strategies that you saw earlier, where the teacher is letting kids do more of the work and they're the guide on the side that provides the assistance, the resources, and uh, the kinds of things that they might need to improve their work. Now, I think I'm almost up to my last slide. I know what you're thinking, give me a break. How can we accommodate all of these things? I got 26 students and where can I find the time? Well, we took a hint from places like Google and Microsoft and Amicon. Do you know that every week I get a personal letter from Amazon? Dear Joseph Renzulli, or hello Joseph Renzulli, it says there. And they send me certain books that they think I will buy. Now, how do they know that? Very simple. We have their, pro they have my profile. They know what I bought. Go buy something, go buy a desk lamp tomorrow on online. And for the next month, you're going to get desk lamp advertisements because they've got your profile now. They know what you like and they know what you buy. And so this is, again, the reason that we develop Renzulli Learning. And Sally's going to talk about this uh, as we move along by giving you some examples. So I'm going to turn this over to Sally and enjoy it very much. And I'll be around for questions and answers. The work that Joe and I have been doing over these many, many years, I think is best illustrated by this photograph. We want to um, cause learning to be more engaging, more enjoyable. And when we talk about strength-based learning and we talk about um, the idea of, of enrichment-based and strength-based teaching strategies, I think it's really important to note that that's what the gifted education field has been so successful at doing. We have the best pedagogy of any educational group or any educational movement in the world. And I think we need to more and more talk about why we should be using it and how we should be using it. So, so much of our work has been built on talent development and developing gifts and talents. This is Joe's um, three ring conception of giftedness, where we he talks about giftedness being brought being actually uh, a cluster three clusters of abilities: above average ability, task commitment, and creativity. And we believe that talent development comes from planned, purposeful, and integrative processes to that are designed to attract and develop and motivate and engage students. The goal of talent development, as Joe said, is developing creative, high-performing, happy, and engaged students who know their interests and develop and want to develop their talents to make the world a better place. And so that's the background of the school-wide enrichment model. This looks like it's a, a, a lot of information, but it's a very simple diagram. And really, if we think about what Joe introduced and what I'll be talking about, our strength-based and enrichment teaching strategies, pedagogy strategies, are right down the first column. So we're looking at looking at students' strengths, modifying curriculum, providing enrichment learning and teaching for more students, and then also bringing some of this enrichment to bear upon the regular curriculum, that what parents are doing at home now, and as Joe mentioned, a series of opportunities called enrichment clusters. In other words, our view of enrichment is as follows. We believe 
that enrichment should be enjoyable, engaging, and create enthusiasm for learning. The students that you heard about and the students that we followed for many, many years are enthusiastic about what they do. Some of this is built into Renzulli Learning, and I want to mention that we're extremely proud that it is now free and free and available to use until the, the August. So if you log on tonight, you can get a, a free, you can get Renzulli Learning free for your students, for your school. And again, we're pleased about that because we think it makes this brand of pedagogy so much easier. So essentially, instead of doing paper and pencils to learn about strengths, students sit down at a computer, they answer a series of research-based questions, and we identify their top three areas of interest, their top three preferred ways they like to learn, and their top three product styles. I, I just took a profiler and I drew these circles so you can see this is um, Jackie, and Jackie's top area of interest is technology. Jackie's top way he likes to, she likes to learn is technology, and her top product practice technology. So you have no doubts about Jackie when you think a little bit about what she wants to do and how she wants to do it. It doesn't always line up this way, but this is what a profile does, and this can be done in about 20 minutes. You can also choose the language, by the way, when you're doing the profile. So if you have many of your students who are, um, speak Spanish as their first language, the questions in the profile and the profiler can be done in Spanish. The second major pedagogy service in the school-wide enrichment model is modifying curriculum, compacting curriculum. I'll talk a little bit more, up. we've talked just briefly about it, but this is a really important strategy and there's three steps to it. The first is name your the child's strength area. If you're dealing with someone who's in a very advanced reader or, or someone who's very advanced in math, you want to be able to identify where the strengths are you want to document how you know that your student is strong in those areas, and you want to change it. But you don't want to change it by just giving more work. You want to change it whenever possible by providing opportunities for enrichment in areas of interest. And that's a huge core of what Joe and I have talked about for the last 40 years, and that's interest. This is, of course, the major core of the school-wide enrichment model, and also the major core of the teaching strategies, the strength-based strategies, and also the interest-based strategies that you know are the basis for our webinar tonight, our conversation with you tonight. Um, there are probably 150 studies that have been done on the school-wide enrichment model. You can access a summary of the research on SEM uh, for free on our website, and I will show you the links for those resources a couple times in just a few minutes. But just keep in mind, so many of them are critical. This to me is probably one of the most important that students, when bright students, identified gifted students were underachieving, when they were given the opportunity to complete a type three study, to use enrichment in school on a topic of their interest, 82% of these young people reverse their underachievement. And that is, this is one of the biggest problems that we face with bright kids. and. We believe this is probably one of the most important studies that's been done on our model and on our work. So again, in this, there's, there's three different types of enrichment. There's exposure, there's training, and there's opportunities for small group and small group projects. And what we want to do for children during this time, as Joe said, is provide them with an opportunity to experience what it's like to do creative and productive work and to feel good about it. So you saw the ladybug game. Let me introduce one other student. And this is a young boy named Michael. And Michael participated in an enrichment cluster on starting his own business, being a social entrepreneur. And essentially what Michael decided is that he wanted to develop a business so that he could buy uh, hats and gloves for high poverty children in his area, many of them immigrants. Michael lived in the very cold Northeast and wanted to buy, you know, again, mittens, gloves, scarves for children. He got a loan from his principal um, after he decided what his business would be. His district was using Renzulli Learning. He was able to identify um, how-to books that he needed. He was able to access many, many websites to start his business. And what Michael actually developed was a business that was um, based on making buttons. 
So he figured out his business. He had partners. I should mention Michael was in second grade when he started this project, third grade when it when it you know when it finished. Um, but here he is. Uh, we were able to meet him. Joe and Del Sigley met him at a at an enrichment cluster fair, and here he is showing Joe with great pride his buttons. And I think this is the this is what strength based pedagogy is all about. And this is what is so important in a talent focused approach. We want enrichment and educational experiences to align with students' strengths, interests, and talents. We can use those strengths to, to teach students skills. We can use those strengths to increase engagement and enable personal expressions and, and really think about developing the next generation, as Joe said, of inventors and produ producers and creators. And by the way, since so many of you are home today, I think you can also realize that you can do some of this at home. Um, this is our youngest daughter. Joe and I are blessed to have two daughters. This is our youngest daughter. Uh, and this is her first enrichment cluster. I happen to be facilitating a cluster in the school and got to take this shot of her. This is the day she fell in love with theater. She made her first puppet. Um, and I, I just want to indicate that it was both a school and a home partnership that developed her interest and, and helped her become um, what she is today. So just a, a personal story. Uh, she was in elementary school. She took dance lessons, which we of course paid for. She wrote plays every year. Here she wrote a play about unsinkable Molly Brown. This is my grandmother's, some of my grandmother's clothing that she used as a costume. That's her headshot actually from high school. She starred in every high school play. In middle school, her teachers compacted her curriculum. She headed off to Northwestern University to be a theater major. Here's her headshot from Northwestern, and where is she today? She's 32. She is a, and this is from her website. Her name is Liza Renzulli. She's a filmmaker, comedian, writer, editor, um, podcaster. Her podcast is 51 First Dates. She's just finished doing an editing job for Comedy Central. The point is, she loves what she does, and she was blessed by having a school district that promoted her talents as well as parents that promoted her talents. And that's what enrichment teaching and learning is all about. Again, it's about exposure. It's about exposing children to different kinds of opportunities. We certainly took her to plays. We certainly helped in the school. We certainly made sure that she had the book she needed, but we also supported her type threes. At one point, she turned her our dining room table into a puppet theater. And this is what it takes to be able to develop the kinds of pedagogy and, and student strengths that, that results in having creative young people who grow up to do creative things. So just in summary of this section, think a little bit about type ones. Now, especially assigning students virtual field trips, assigning them opportunities for online uh, activities, DVDs and, and movies that they can read online, clips, contests, and competition. All of the resources on Renzulli Learning, and there are 50,000 that are selected and vetted, particularly for students, um, are, are free. And again, this is a great time to experiment with this. Um, when you are back in school, when we are all back and in, in, uh, being, being able to expose students to speakers and bringing people into the school, I love this slide. This is a a local historical society director uh, who's retired but comes to speak at schools every once in a while. And he spoke to a classroom of about 30 students, but look at the joy in the faces of these young girls who went up to ask him questions. This is enrichment pedagogy, and this is what our field is so well known for. It's making sure that students are exposed, again, to wonderful places, people, ideas. Now there's so many opportunities to expose them to brief clips online, to documentaries, to poetry. Um, and when you think about the kinds of exposure you can do, and again, having it be vetted. Um, I once facilitated an enrichment cluster on poetry. And I, I think my students, the students that took that cluster that, that I facilitated, you know, were exposed to 30 or 40 of the most famous poets who ever lived. 
we can expose students to old photographs. Um, in Renzulli Learning, we actually have many Library of Congress links with just outstanding historical opportunities. So this is a great way of providing pedagogy to all students. The second type of enrichment, as Joe mentioned, process training, and this is where so much of the critical thinking that comes in. And this has been adapted over time. There's actually six clusters of pedagogy. So um, cognitive, creative, and critical thinking skills, learning how to learn skills, character development, affective, interpersonal, intrapersonal skills, knowing your strengths, knowing your interests, understanding how to use advanced resources, metacognitive technology skills right now, and then also just the idea of how do I provide things to an audience, written, oral, and physical uh, and, and visual communication skills. So much of what gifted ed pedagogy, strength-based pedagogy enables us to do, again, we have tried to identify and embed within our model and within Renzulli Learning. Um, so if you think a little bit about critical thinking or online activities, I think this is just such a wonderful example um, I was reading my nieces, my niece is graduating, well, she would have been graduating from UConn, she's virtually graduating from the University of Connecticut as a senior, and she it was writing her last paper, and she asked me to read it last night before she handed it in at midnight, and her paper was about fake websites, and all of the fake websites and all of the ways that Twitter uh, has promoted fake websites today and made me think of this slide, uh, which really is a, a fake website set up by researchers about a tree octopus. Now, if you say tree octopus just for a second, we would realize that this cannot exist. Octo octopi cannot live on trees. But yet, in several different research studies done by research teams, um, what we found is that, you know, 98 to 99 percent of students fell for this. They actually wanted to do fundraising for tree <laughs> octopi. octopi. And, and so there's probably never been a time where we need good type two training skills more than we do now. And then of, la of course, the last part of the enrichment triad model, the best pedagogy for enrichment teaching and learning is projects. When we do longitudinal studies with students that have been in school-wide enrichment model programs, they tell us over and over again about the type threes they did, the projects they did, the trips that they took, the opportunities they had to do things that were memorable, uh, to the type ones that they went on. And so many projects um, have been built into Renzulli Learning, but also so many projects um, have been done by students under the tutelage and guidance of a teacher. And, and so right now, when we think about contests and competitions and how-to books and all of the ways that we can guide students in strength-based pedagogy, think about creating interest centers that can now be done online. I mean, when I think about what I used to do to create paper interest centers at the back of my classroom and now realize that, and, and by the way, if we were in school, I would still advocate that we would do some of this, but right now there's so much that we can provide that's again, already vetted, that makes things, the kinds of things that we want to do, that we can send to students, that we can have them watch, that we can have them participate in, that results in this, this kind of a face, this kind of a joy of learning. And so uh, another important gifted education pedagogy strategy is supporting the struggle. And I don't think there's a better way to introduce that than to talk a little bit about uh, Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. If we let bright students choose the first project or the first type three they wanted to do um, and, and just told them to do it, they would be writing a lot of reports. Instead, what we advocate in enrichment pedagogy is supporting the struggle, have students realizing what it takes to go to the next level. And that can be done mainly with a teacher and a student and, and also parents. So if you're parents of students, we know this is hard and particularly with bright kids who want to get away with their very first attempt at something. But what we want students to learn is to be able to have supported struggles. So by saying, how could you do that differently? 
How could we use different resources? Maybe this is a better idea for your project. You know, the ladybug game didn't appear that way at the first draft and neither did the button factory. You know, all of these take time and effort, which can be supported by teachers that want to facilitate interest. And that's what strength-based pedagogy really is. So when we think uh, in gifted education about strength-based pedagogy, particularly lose, use, losing using our approach, and by the way, this is a young Mexican girl who developed a solar water heater um, and she did not patent this. She gave the instructions away because many people in her small, poor village in Mexico had never had a hot bath. So she developed a, a, a way to make a solar water heater so people could have hot baths uh, in Mexico. And it's been so exciting for us to see the results of this type of gifted education pedagogy spread across the globe. So what, what is some of this pedagogy? It's, it's ways to differentiate. It's ways to compact the curriculum, to teach the curriculum in an ex expedient but thorough fashion so that students who already know it or can learn it in a fraction of the time have an opportunity to do that. It's, it's, it's virtual field trips, it's creativity training, it's problem solving, like with future problem solving. It's giving kids early stage projects, what we call type two and a half, and hoping that those will gear up into type threes. And it's giving students time to pursue their interests. All of these things are of critical importance to us. It's providing enrichment clusters. Um, these are done in schools that are using SEM for all students. Um, oftentimes, they're done on a Friday afternoon. This is when students come together with teachers, um, oftentimes across two or three grade levels. Teachers facilitate a cluster that they want to do. Students participate in clusters that they choose. Um, this is one from Bridges Academy in, in Los Angeles, California, which is a school for twice exceptional students and uh, students who are both at a very, very much advanced, but also have significant learning disabilities. And they have clusters every Friday afternoon all year long. And this is one called Culinary Critics. But one of Joe's and my favorite things in the spring is to be able to, in the fall, is to be able to visit schools that are doing clusters and see the thousands of different ideas that teachers have for enrichment clusters. Here's one on Save Our Planet. And here, here's one on crime scene investigation. And here's one that was done in a California school on water watchers during drought time. And as you can tell, if you can see the flowers over my back, I'm a gardener. Here's one that I might do on horticulture. And again, the way that a lot of bright students have time to do this is with curriculum compacting, having an opportunity to be able to prove that they can do the work in a fraction of the time and then to change it. And again, we believe strongly that enrichment pedagogy enables teachers to serve as resident escalators. This is where the Vygotsky supported challenge come in, supported struggle comes in. Teachers, as Joe said, serving on a gu as guides on the side and supporting uh, talent development activities across all different interests. So when we think again about what's a strength-based talent development approach, it's using strengths and interests to facilitate the kinds of enrichment pedagogy that our field's known for, all the way from Sandy Kaplan's work to depth and complexity to our work in strength-based instruction and embedding critical creative thinking and problem solving, creative productivity. So students grow up to be inventors and writers and musicians. This is not that difficult. It isn't that hard. Uh, in fact, you know, I think many of us want to do this with our own children. We want to embrace their, their need for challenge. We want to provide their social and emotional um, development and make them happy to be in school. So, Many resources are at your fingertips tonight. Renzulli Learning free until August. We hope many of you will try that at home with your own students um, that you're working with, with your classrooms, with your schools. Joe mentioned our gifted, www.gifted.ucon.edu. Um, our school-wide enrichment model, there are free resources. There's an entire folder on it. Um, and I think, you know, what I, I just like to kind of 
conclude with, and, and before we go into questions, is, is this slide. Um, Joe and I were so blessed last year. We've been married um, almost 40 years, and this is our first grandchild uh, from the two of us. We have two other grandchildren that came from Joe's first son that we love dearly. And this is our beloved Abby, who was born uh, in September of, of 19, so she's now uh, 19 months old. And we had a very early clue to Abby's interest when her music teacher walked into the nursery school she was attending last year. She was about eight or nine months old when this photograph was taken, just started to sit up. And look at the joy on Abby's face when the music teacher walked in. Just look at that face. Now, um, because we're actually quarantined with our daughter and son and, and, our, and our granddaughter, I do a daily time with Abby for music enrichment. I know my friend Ben is listening and he'll be happy to hear that. But this was taken a few weeks ago when I walked in to do my music time with Abby. It's not so hard to figure out what this 19 month old loves. She loves music. Music is going to be an enormous part of her life. And so when we think about enrichment pedagogy, you know, what can you do? You can build opportunities for enjoyment and exposure every day. You can create your students' interests. You can ask yourself, how can I make this more enjoyable? Um, you can make academic memories that last. Uh, the young boy that did the button factory, the little girl that did, um, did the project on ladybugs and turned it into a game. We want students, and this is our friend Del Sigley said, said this all the time, we want students to learn something new every day. I try to expose Abby to a new song every day, and sometimes she sings it and hums it throughout the day. We want to develop and encourage students' strengths and interests. Um, my husband's generally fairly modest, so I'm going to end up with this quote of his. I view our work in talent development and education as a war against educational mediocrity, conformity, and the societal institutions that unknowingly or unknowingly contribute to the suppression of creativity. Many battles must be fought before we achieve the equity that talented and creative students need and deserve. Schools should be places for talent development and all students should have the right and the time to develop their talents. We believe through enrichment pedagogy that we can create giftedness by providing opportunities, resources, and encouragement, always in areas of student interest. That is why Joe and I put so much of our work free on our website. It's why we try to give away uh, ideas and videos and PowerPoints. And that's why we're so thrilled that we can now uh, offer you Renzulu Learning for free. It's also uh, an opportunity for us to think a little bit about the development of interest because if you were to ask me to summarize my 40 years and Joe's 50 years, we would tell you in, our, in this field that interests matter most. So find something that's going to be able to develop your students' interests. Give those students a chance to learn to something joyful and new every day. Think a little bit about ways to do this that are exciting and enriching by providing some of your own opportunities or looking at some of the ones that we can help you identify. And again, we'd like to thank you so much. We were so honored at the turnout tonight. We are so, so pleased. Okay, so we finished with the uh, third part of uh, our presentation today for Joe and Sally. And uh, now we are coming to the uh, fourth part, which is the last part, uh, to answer your questions. But before we uh, open the platform for questions, I would like to welcome my dearest friends, Joe and Sally. Uh, for uh, uh, this event. So you are more than welcome. And um, uh, of course, we started uh, with the introduction of both Joe and Sally, so they will see it in the video and on uh, the tube channel uh, of the ICIE. So uh, Nana, uh, now you are uh, going to coordinate the questions. Um, first of all, you start with people who would like to talk direct to Joe and Sadie, and then uh, we will read the questions from the chatting room. 
Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sally and Joe. Welcome. It is a huge honor to be in your presence again. Always a little bit starstruck <laughs> when you're around. Thank you so much uh, for coming here and joining us. Um, so uh, I think what we will do is we will just ask people who want to ask a question directly to raise their hands. I can see you in the participation list and I will call you out just so that we avoid um, any people talking over each other. We also got 10 questions in the chat, private and public, but I've kind of narrowed it down to five major themes. So um, if those questions don't get answered in person, then I will go ahead and, and ask, ask those questions. So right now I see uh, Abir uh, has their yes. hand up. So please go ahead. Yes, hi everyone. It's really an honor to meet you. Um, uh, I'm a teacher at the Gifted School. It's the first Gifted School in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Jeddah. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah. All right, perfect. And we use the tried uh, pedagogy that you just uh, explained in the videos uh, to teach uh, science units in the regular curriculum. Uh, do you think that's a good idea? So I have the gifted students in my classroom. Each science class is 80 minutes. Uh, I have uh, three science classes a week. And I tr transform the unit into, as you said, uh, type one, type two, type three. So I end up, it's like a, like, like a project-based um, uh, learning, but uh, I do it the way uh, uh, or a way that is suitable for gifted students. Okay. And I'd like your remarks on that, please. <clears throat> Thank so, you. I want to mention, and the first is the regular curriculum is something we will always have with us. Uh, it's uh, dominated by what ministries of education, uh, textbook companies, uh, testing companies uh, feel that all children should learn. <clears throat> I think that one of our roles should be to look into that regular curriculum and with each topic, try to do some brainstorming about what are some ways that you can make that topic more interesting. Remember what uh, the last slide we had on uh, enjoyment, engagement, and enthusiasm for learning. What can make it more enjoyable and more engaging for some, not all, some young people who have expressed an interest? A child that's raised lots of questions about the topic, that's asked uh, if you can meet with that and to discuss anything further. You know, we can always almost tell interest by the, the glow or gleam in a child's eye. Uh, I think that one of the things that uh, we've developed in our work is a process which we call a cur enrichment curricular infusion. And what we do in this process is take a regular required topic, and then we ask a group of teachers, you might ask all the people that teach science to sit down and say, all right, we have to teach uh, uh, this topic. What are some ways that we can make this more interesting for young people who really express an interest in it? I think the other thing that I want to mention is that we would hope that you would set aside for your interested science students a time and a place within the regular school week or every other week where they can come together, what we call an enrichment cluster, where there is no prescribed curriculum. As Sally pointed out, you certainly will use some type ones to open up new topics and interests and ideas. And nowadays with the internet, you can show a scientific video on anything that's ever been dealt with since the invention of the wheel. And um, I think that in this, in this case, we're circumventing the must-dos of the regular curriculum and to the can-dos and want-to-dos that enrichment clusters are really uh, the, the focus. So those are all the two things I can say. If we just go only by the regular curriculum all day, every day, and don't look in how we can uh, contribute some, what I sometimes like to call artistic modification. That's you as a teacher doing artistic things, so to speak, not, not just art, but sci in this case, science, but you're modifying the regular curriculum to make it more interesting and enjoyable and engaging for young people. 
Yeah, I would, I would concur and just say that um, when you're teaching a content area su um, subject like science, I think it's so rewarding to do what you're describing, the type ones in science, the ability to give students time for independent study. When I first read about Joe's work, I was a, an English teacher and, uh, and in my secondary English class, um, I set aside some time each week for type threes. You know, in some ways they might've actually been um, smaller than type threes as students got tar started, but I set aside some time each week for some type ones in English, type twos in English and type threes in English. And the students that did not wanna do type threes, I just gave them more opportunities, you know, for type ones. So, if that's the way you're doing it, that's very similar to what, what I did. And the results were really, really very, very uh, promising. You know, a lot of students did very advanced type threes. I had the highest achievement scores in my entire school without doing any test prep. And students really got into projects and got into learning more about the type ones I was doing that, as Joe said, went beyond the regular curriculum. So even if everyone else in your school isn't doing it, the fact that you're doing this within your science class is very, very rewarding for students. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think you just covered a couple of other questions that related to what do I do? I'm so busy with regular curriculum. I don't have time to do all this additional work uh, with the gifted students. And also a question about how to motivate kids, uh, you know, who are gifted but might be wary about new content or new way of doing things when they're actually used to some other things. So I think uh, some of this covered the uh, uh, some of those questions were covered by the question that you just answered. Um, the other question that got most asks uh, actually is related to something that also biasly interests me, so I will ask it first. <laughs> and that is, uh, with this COVID situation, a lot of teachers are noticing social and emotional skills uh, being a focal point of student needs. Uh, so there was quite a few questions around how do you balance these emotional needs? What do we do with students' emotional needs? And also there's some questions around this in terms of this online kind of uh, teaching. Those are excellent questions. You know, our granddaughter, who is a junior in high school, just um, had a young, young boy that sits next to her in her English class kill himself last week. So it, this is, these issues are foremost on our mind. And I think that the one thing that we can um, understand is the need for some kind of enjoyment in learning and also the opportunity to share that with other students. So creating some online community creating some online um, groups of students, watching things and having discussions together. Um, there are any number of schools now that are doing enrichment clusters using, you know, the Groom, the Zoom or, or other Teams grouping function. So students are able to work together once a week in these enrichment clusters, which are in areas of interest. And of course, even just having teachers send individual projects or type ones to students saying, hey, I was thinking of you. I thought you might want to do this type one online. What we're finding is any kind of, I mean, it will never replace in person looking at kids with our eyes, but any type of virtual touch we can do that is sending enrichment activities, creating these online communities, reaching out to individual students about whom you have some concerns because you haven't been hearing about it, um, that can make a difference. And, and of course, one of the greatest antidotes to depression is, is finding an interest, finding something you like to do that interests you. So kind of the, the consistent um, opportunity to develop students' interests is one of the best ways to combat loneliness and isolation. Honestly, if, if people have um, hobbies, avocations, if they're interested in their work, you're giving them the greatest gift you can, you can ever give. Um, there's so many young people that we don't even ask the question, you know, what do you like to do? And let's think about finding, you know, post-secondary career options in that. And 
that all the new careers that are that can be so much more interest based those are critical questions so even the idea of building a talent development portfolio like a talent portfolio a talent uh, what we call a talent development portfolio can be the first step what do you like what do you what, but but i think right now in particular any positive online contact we can give if you're not seeing your students uh, live um, <clears throat> is, going, is going to help with this process. You know, one, one of the things that I would recommend, um, I know um, my colleague Del Sigley and I did this last summer, is to uh, find the tech person in your school, tech specialist, and learn how to use uh, the grouping functions. And uh, what Del and I did, we would cover a topic and then we would divide people up into groups and they would work among themselves for 15 minutes and then they would come back and report to the group at large. And um, one of the things they said was uh, in, in their messages to us and online is, could we extend that grouping time from uh, 15 minutes to 20 minutes? And then they wanted to go to 25 minutes. So uh, most of the online learning, unfortunately, is young people looking at screens and listening, and sometimes again uh, doing worksheets online. And I think that any any of the grouping functions that are out there, and they're getting better all the time, uh, are, really should be in the uh, toolkit of the uh, school uh, uh, technology uh, specialist. And so get together and learn those grouping functions and then figure out, don't always make the same groups. We always rotated our groups, so it wasn't the same three or four people working together all the time. And we even had little competitions among groups and we would have a, a controversial question and we would uh, ask one group to debate the pros of uh, acceleration and another group to uh, debate the pros of enrichment and then let them go at it a little bit. Uh, we can build some of that in. I don't think, as Sally said, it will ever replace the face-to-face, -face, but I honestly believe that teachers that are going to do this online are going to be better when school comes back full-time because there is a lot of social and emotional development that takes place when the teacher steps aside, is no longer the sage on the stage, but the guide on the side will call you if we need you. And I think that that could actually improve our teaching overall, whether it's in person or online. Also, um, one other um, pitch for social emotional needs and social emotional intelligence, the research is pretty clear that helping others is one of the best ways to help yourself. So one of the things we try to do in the school-wide enrichment model is to identify you know, small problems in a school, small small problems in a community that students can actually try to solve, so, um, or help with. I mean, we can't solve hunger, for example, but kids could do a food drive. So in terms of positive social and emotional connections, if you can think of small things that students can do to help others in the community and invite them to potentially think about pursuing that, even if it's not a full-fledged type three or type two and a half, just even small acts. Many of the enrichment clusters that we developed actually provide services for the community. Um, and so we, you know, one, that one that's kind of a classic is helping hands, giving hearts. And it's the thought that, you know, students are making cards for senior citizens uh, centers. They're doing drive-bys now a lot in Connecticut because we're still so isolated. Um, and people are in such deep quarantines here. So I think trying to identify ways that students can use their talents to, or even their organizational skills, all students, not just identified students, to give back and do something in the community would be helpful. One of the things that um, Sally and I saw on American television this morning was uh, a group in, I believe, Seattle, uh, who took off on a Form student project. The project was what the students called free little library where they put these uh, little boxes outside with a door on them and you could go there and get a book free mm -hmm. and put a book in. 
And so this other group came up with the idea of a free little art gallery. And uh, you could put things, again, it's just like a little box with a glass window. You could go and put some artwork in there and other people could come and get it, but they could also put their own artwork in. And I think that uh, those are the kinds of things that promote creativity, that pr promote what Sally just mentioned, which are community action projects. And so uh, brainstorm a little bit about some of the kinds of things, again, that can make our community a, a, a friendlier, happier place uh, by, as Sally said, giving somebody something is always very, very satisfying. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, building communities and finding ways to connect students with each other and with their community, it's super important. I think for us adults also. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. So then uh, maybe I will ask another question that had to do with identification because there was maybe three or four questions around that. Um, I know this is a topic for a semestered course <laughs> in university, uh, but maybe one of the more specific questions was about how often do you think kids need to redo uh, their interest uh, quiz that you have at, uh, to see how the interests have changed? And maybe if you have some kind of overall um, advice in terms of identification that you feel is important that this group hears in addition to what was already said in the videos. Good question. I do believe that at least annually we should look at the profile, the student's profile, and especially uh, things that relate to interest. But we also should have a time, any time that a new interest develops, that we can respond to that in some way. A number of years ago, uh, Sally and I created an instrument which we called the Action Information Message. We even drew it in the shape of a light bulb on a, bit, on a regular piece of paper. And we asked, uh, we gave them to teachers and they also had uh, copies, duplicate copies, uh, like a carbon, we used to call them carbon copies. Now they have another name for it. And if a child showed a particular interest, the teacher filled that out. And then when they had a team meeting of teachers or if there was a gifted uh, education specialist uh, in the building that was sent to that person and saying uh, during such and such a class in American history or in science or whatever the topic might be Johnny or Susie or Tommy uh, expressed an interest in and pull that out so what you're really doing is making an action information notation that somebody some other teacher really might be a community person a parent uh, or uh, somebody that can help a child with online resources. But so that's really what is the best case of what we call ongoing identification. And then again, I think we should review things each year because children do make changes. Um, we have a series of instruments that we use with children regularly and we have them for like the interest ELISA. We have a primary edition, elementary edition a high school edition. We even use it for incoming graduate students. I want to know what a graduate student is specially interested in before they ever set foot on campus. And so I think that even giving them back, one of the things that I did when I was teaching, I gave them back to the students at a, uh, a given period of time and asked them to add on to it in a different color ink. So if it was written in black ink originally, they did it in blue ink or green ink. And that way I could quickly look at it and say, oh, how this interest has changed. You know, in terms of identification for gifted programming, I know that some of you are in gifted schools, you mentioned that, so that generally is identification is already done, but we, we believe it's critical that it be multidimensional, that is not just one kind of information that if you're using test scores, they're locally normed. That is, you're looking at the top students in your school, not across the country, for example, because there's a top 10% or top 20% in every school, and that you link identification you know, to programming. So the real question when I teach a course or 
do a couple of classes on identification in an introductory course is I always try to start out by saying identification for what? Why are you identifying? So we want the identification to be linked to the services that students have. And I think that, that by linking them, those things to services, by using local norms, um, then, then we have, a, and, and also by looking at multiple criteria, we have a much a better and safer and more inclusive system. Joe and I have written extensively on this. And on our website, there are, um, uh, in English, articles about identification, chapters about identification. And, um, and actually, Joe has a, a new article uh, on assessment of, of other kinds of info, assessment for learning as opposed to assessment of learning. So we continue to evolve on this, but I think those are the big ideas that we think about identification for what, linking identification to services, we use local norms, and we consider multiple criteria. So we don't exit students just because they don't meet one criteria. We look at a broadened uh, conception of giftedness and of talent development, and we use multiple criteria. And those are the big ideas in the system we've developed. Just uh, two things. Uh, the uh, article that Sally mentioned is due uh, I, sometime next year uh, for publication in Gifted Education uh, in okay. International, GEI. And uh, it does talk about gathering information about interest and exec executive functions and expression styles. The other thing I wanted to mention is that the Sally and I talked the publisher of our book on the school-wide enrichment model into allow, allowing people to download and reproduce all of the forms and instruments that we've developed over the years. So if you go to the site of Proof Rock uh, Publishers, it's on our site too. It's on our site as well at the University of Connecticut like the action information message that I just mentioned or the interestalizers, those things can be downloaded. And we always say free without having to ask permission. You can co copy them, use them any way you want. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we believe is that the more we know about these things, in addition to what we always find out, which is what their achievement or IQ or cognitive ability test scores are, the more we know about interest always leads the list. The more we know about how a youngster likes to learn. Do they like to learn by uh, lecture? Do they like to learn by more uh, group interaction? Do they like to learn by simulation? Look at all of the, the uh, games that kids are playing on their computers and iPads now. Those are all simulations. Well, we put a lot of them into Renzulli Learning. Um, but anyway, uh, the way a young person likes to express themselves, do they like to write about it, talk about it, make a film, a video? Do they like it to, uh, more graphically, figurally, picturally? When I can find that out about someone, anyone, diapers through doctorate, I can then make more meaningful programming options available to that person. Um, I wish I could send you that um, article right now, but it's not, it's not the something you can do when something has been accepted for publication. Watch Gifted Ed Ed Education International within the next issue or two. Also in, in the journal for ICI, um, there's an award-winning article on identification of multicultural students that Joe published with Laurel Brandon a couple of years ago, and that's available in the journal Tassir edits. And, and that actually won the Mensa award, which is so interesting because it talks about a broadened way to identify students, especially students from culturally diverse groups. Uh, 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 Tassir, is that, uh, you said it was gonna be in the January issue. Is that out yet? Oh, it's already out. Yeah, about, to, about to be uh, out. Let, let folks here uh, know where they can get it. Yeah, uh, it is available free of charge, and also it is uh, available on the website. So within uh, two weeks, it will be uh, there. Thank you. Yeah. 
Other questions? Yes, so Tessir allowed me to ask two more, even though now as you're talking, there's so much more in the chat and I'm so sorry, but we're not gonna be able to get to all of them. I will ask uh, two more questions. One is from our dear friend, Connie Phelps from Kansas Emporia University. So I know you're gonna like hearing from her. So I will ask that question. Uh, she says, within the school-wide enrichment model, could the curriculum compacting strategy serve as an acceleration shortcut? Yes, short yes. answer yes. to that. That's our brand of acceleration. Hi, Connie. Uh, just a <laughs> quick note that when they did the, uh, the big study at Iowa uh, with Nick Colangelo, that compacting is one of the chapters that's in their big acceleration handbook. So it is a method for both enrichment and acceleration. And also keep in mind that there's acceleration of regular curriculum material, but when a student like the little girl from Mexico builds a solar water heater, that's also acceleration of content that isn't necessarily in the regular curriculum. And I always like to make sure we distinguish between those two types of, enrich, of acceleration. So kind of enriched acceleration and then regular curricular acceleration. Nice to hear that you're on, Connie. <laughs> And then the last question, which is maybe a little bit of a flip side to that one, and that is, could we teach the regular curriculum using ELT? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that was the response to the question about science. The, the teacher that from the gifted school that said, I'm using um, the enrichment triad model to teach science. Yeah, I mean, you can um, compact the regular curriculum provide infusion of type one, type two, type three activities. And so absolutely, um, you know, when, when I was trying to start enrichment programs in the thousands of schools that we've worked with over the, over the many years we've been doing this, if we could not get all teachers engaged or involved, we started with the teachers that were most interested. And we asked them to do exactly what the science teacher described and I described that we did, and that is provide ex enriched accelerated learning experiences by using compacting and enrichment one type one, two, and three brought to bear upon the regular language arts or science or social studies curricula. In fact, we used to call these um, not honors classes, but triad science and triad social studies and triad history classes. And that kind of embedded the notion of this enrichment right into the class. So that's an excellent way to start. Um, and, and also, obviously, it works even better if you have someone to help, like an enrichment specialist, to escalate the type threes. But many, many teachers, um, you know, in SEM schools do a lot of this in self-contained classes within their content areas. One of the things that... Um... I believe is that if we can get teachers as all of what Sally and I have discussed and you heard in the, in the presentation to just be a little bit more creative themselves, then a lot of these things will take place. Uh, one of the things I can send you and I'll send this to Sasir as soon as we sign off is a chapter that we did uh, in a book Sally edited uh, on infusion and there's a thing in there called the creative idea generator. And this really, mm -hmm. talk about social emotional, this is great for teachers too, because we ask teachers to work together in a small group, any regularly required curricular topic mm -hmm. and brainstorm uh, how they can actually make that <laughs> more uh, interesting and engaging. And so uh, I'll send that to Tassir and uh, if you use it, just you can even use just a plain piece of paper, but uh, divide your uh, teachers up into small groups and then ask them to come up with ideas and then share those ideas. Uh, I had one group that was working on a very rigidly required topic in the uh, US curriculum, the, the uh, memorization of the states and the capitals of those states. And in 10 minutes, they came up with 22 very exciting ideas about how they could make that memory-oriented required topic more fun and more interesting and engaging. So uh, the other thing before we sign off is uh, Sally and I 
I uh, want to thank Tassir for organizing this and inviting us. Uh, he has spent his entire career uh, trying to make the world a better place by uh, encouraging more uh, services to teachers that could then be uh, manifested in the kinds of things that we do with the kids that we hope will make the world a better place. So thank you again, Tassir, for all that you do. And we are honored and proud to be able to join you in this event. Thank you, Joe, because uh, this is what we learned from you. Uh, you are our international mentor and uh, the human uh, and the humble uh, scholar who always contribute uh, countlessly and uh, without any barriers. So uh, you are uh, the one who motivated us to do what we are doing. And in the name of, uh, I, I am proud of you and Sadi for all what you are doing. You both make uh, gifted education completely different and uh, very sustainable. And uh, for us, it is a unique opportunity to have both you and Sadi in this uh, ICIE talks in the name of the International Center for Innovation in Education, ICIE, and on behalf of the participants uh, today, I would like to thank my dear friends and mentors, uh, Jorin Zudi and Sadi Reese, for their unique contribution at the international level. And in addition to that, I strongly recommend uh, Rinzuli Learning System. Uh, this system is there since many years, and it has many unique functions and features which can be employed effectively in your school and for your teachers, because you can use this platform in your uh, differentiation efforts in order to offer the right enrichment activities and in addition to that, you can use it to uh, make capacity building for your uh, teachers. Because based on uh, all sub-theories and all theories created by both Joe and Sadi are working. And uh, as we said at the very beginning, the rationale behind this talk is very strong one. That in the context of the regular school, you can employ a school-wide enrichment model. Now you have also uh, other facilities like the Renzuri learning system where can, you can combine, you can combine theory and the practice in addition to uh, what is available uh, uh, as the resources. And uh, also uh, last and not, but not least, I would like to thank all of you for joining us from different parts of the world. And I can say we have more than 80 countries joined today uh, for this speech. And you know who attracted these people? Uh, it, uh, uh, they were attracted or you were attracted by Joe and Sally because I know you are proud of these two people and you appreciate all their contributions. And also, I would like to thank uh, my team, uh, Nana Kulic uh, from Croatia and Ahmed Shahruj from Sharjah. And thank you again. And see you soon. Okay, thank you. Be healthy, everybody. <laughs>